Thank you very much, Karina, and good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to thank first the, thank the RCPI for this opportunity to speak this afternoon. So like Chris, I'll start with where I'm coming from. And in my role in the, the Health Service Executive as the Director of the Global Health Programme, the question I ask myself is why do, does our health service need to engage globally and our health institutions and our health professionals? And there are several reasons for this. And it's firstly about our own health service. If we are to deliver high quality health care in Ireland, we need a global approach because today health issues are global. But beyond that, we have a commitment worldwide. Our country is committed to better health in the world under the framework of the UN Sustainable Development Goals. And if you read Ireland's international development policy, A Better World, you'll see that the Health Service Executive is referenced in that. Furthermore, when we look at the challenges we face today, so many of them are transnational. They can't be solved by one country alone. And COVID is a great example of that. But it applies for other issues like inequalities, migration, climate change. We need to work together. So when we talk about the, the low vaccination coverage in Africa and low-income countries, well, that's not just their problem. That's also our problem. Now, in terms of responding, Chris, in his presentation, spoke about multi-agency collaboration. So I'd like to say that's already been happening through the pandemic. And the HSC and other agencies have been involved in responding. And as one example here, in, in May and June, Ireland made donations of equipment and PPE and drugs to India, Nepal, and Brazil. And for me, it's, it's a story I like to tell that on a Friday evening at 7 p.m., I had a call from Vita Hamilton, who's the clinical lead, clinical advisor in the HSE. The week that we've been watching these pictures on TV of, of in, from India, of millions of people dying from AIDS or dying from, H, from COVID because of lack of oxygen. And we had oxygen concentrators available to donate. And the question was, how do we donate them? And that sparked engagement with Department of Foreign Affairs, Department of Health, Department of Housing, the EU through the Civil Protection Mechanism, the Indian authorities in, in, in India, and the Indian ambassador here, and people in logistics here. By Sunday, we had a plane organized to arrive on Monday to take the oxygen concentrates to India. And I was amazed to see what could be done when public agencies work together and how, how effective and, and quickly that worked. It reminded me of Nelson Mandela saying, it's only possible, impossible until it's done. So for global vaccination, equity is the key word. And we've had exa examples and perspectives on that from the different speakers so far. And as Dr. Sadiq from Bahrain said, unless we have equal opportunities all over the globe, controlling this pandemic is going to be very difficult. Now, in Ireland, the contrast is very striking because we've been so successful. And looking at 90% coverage among our, our population over 18, and thinking of the less than 3% in Africa. So inequity, it's, it's a symptom of broader socioeconomic inequalities and failures of global governance for health. So it's not new. What, what has happened in the pandemic, it's been exposed, and we've seen it, and maybe in ways we haven't seen it before the existing inequities within and between countries. And so I would say that addressing inequity needs to be at the heart of our response at this stage of the pandemic. Now, just to give a bit of a picture of the current situation, and I'm going to particularly look at Africa, where most of the low-income countries in the world are, and also compare with Europe. This is a picture from last week's situation report from WHO. And I'll make just a couple of comments about it. What you see there is that Africa has relatively reported few, a lower number of cases and deaths than other parts of the world. It has had been less affected. The other thing to note is that the trend you'll see there is downwards across most regions. 
And that is also true in Africa. And in that particular week, there'd been a 45% reduction in cases and a 25% reduction in mortality. Now, that wasn't due to vaccination. So it's interesting to see the pattern in Africa. This is another picture from the situation report. And again, just showing how relatively Africa has not experienced the level of, of deaths from, from COVID that has been experienced in other parts of the world. Now, if we look at some of the figures comparing Africa and Europe, you'll see there's actually about a 15-fold difference in COVID deaths in Europe, a rate of COVID deaths in Europe compared to Africa. Now, we know there's underreporting in Africa, but even allowing for that, it's clear that the impact has been less. So we might say, well, what's the difference in Africa? And that's not the subject for today's presentation, but we know that the demographic profile is different. They have much lower population of, of people in the older age group. We know the distribution of population is different, more people living in rural areas, although there are some very big cities as well in Africa. We know there's different prevalence of disease that would put people at a different risk for to, to the effects of COVID, though probably prevalence of both chronic and infectious diseases is higher in, in Africa than it is in Ireland. And there are other factors. But today we're looking at vaccination. And of course, the goal is not just vaccination, the goal is immunity. And immunity both comes from infection and it comes from vaccination. Last month, I came across this report from the Journal of the American Medical Association of a study in Kenya. And this reported that the prevalence of COVID antibodies in Kenya had increased from 4% to 48% over one year to the first quarter of this year. Right up to now, only 2%, less than 2% of the population are vaccinated. So what we're seeing in Kenya, and this is a population of over 50 million people, that natural infection is outpacing vaccination in increasing immunity in, in the population. And so that's something that needs to be factored into to planning for vaccination. But one of the notable things with Africa, with COVID, is that the impact has been much greater in an indirect way than directly from COVID. There's been a huge socioeconomic impact due to lockdowns, disruptions to livelihoods, and so on. A huge impact on physical and mental health. And interestingly, over the period since the pandemic started, there have been about 150,000 reported deaths from COVID in Africa. Over that same period, there have been more than half a million deaths from, from AIDS, more than 400,000 from TB, more than 400,000 from malaria. And the services for those diseases have been impacted. So there have been a big impact on essential health services. And this report that's just come out from the Global Fund last month has a quote from the executive director that these numbers are stark confirmation of what we feared might happen when COVID-19 struck. In many countries, COVID-19 has overwhelmed health systems, lockdowns have disrupted service provisions, and critical resources have been diverted from the fight against HIV, TB and malaria to fight the new pandemic. So in, in thinking how to address the global vaccine inequity, can we learn from experience? In March this year, Winnie Bianima, the executive director of UN AIDS, spoke at the Oireachtas Joint Committee on Foreign Affairs and Defence, very powerfully about the experience with AIDS and what we can learn from that. Like AIDS, COVID is revealing the underlying fissures of inequality, how they hurt all of us, and how outdated rules and approaches obstruct us from overcoming them. Fixing them is a policy choice. It is a moral public health and economic imperative to ensure that everyone gets vaccinated in 2021 and that no one is left behind. We must, we should learn from the lessons from, from HIV and AIDS. Looking back to that period during the 1990s when millions died in Africa, antiretroviral therapy had become available, but in the richer countries and it was expensive and big pharma and big governments, it has to be said, influenced the prices remaining high so that they were unaffordable to poor countries. Thankfully, things changed with 2000. After that, with the Millennium Development Goals and renewed commitments from the global community. And interestingly then, the issue of, that, that Chris mentioned about TRIPS, trade-related aspects of intellectual property rights, that was a live issue then too. And the Doha Declaration in 2001 was adopted that reaffirmed the flexibility of TRIPS member states in circumventing patent rights for better access to essential medicines. 
And that was important in enabling countries like India and Brazil and others to produce generic antiretroviral drugs. What's interesting too with, with AIDS is the new global strategy is about focusing on inequalities. It's an issue, a common issue across health issues, not just COVID. I've put in a picture too, that I, a photograph I took in Zambia in 2004 of a SARS poster superimposed on an HIV poster in a country at the time where more than 20% of adults had HIV and were dying from AIDS as a consequence because there was no treatment. Zambia never had a reported confirmed case of SARS. But just interesting to see how an issue that affects all of the world and the richer countries has an impact on the way the lower income countries are able to respond to their challenges. So what should Ireland do? Well, we've heard from WHO that the, the rollout of the vaccination in, in, in Africa is very low, and only about a third of countries hit the 10% target at the end of September. And they're saying that to stop the pandemic, we need to vaccinate at least 40% of people in every country by the end of 2021, and at least 70% by the first half of 2022. So we're a long way from that. So what do we need? Well, Chris Patrick spoke about, um, he spoke about political leadership and he spoke about medical ethics. So maybe along similar lines, I got to talk about solidarity and leadership. And Ireland is a good country. I think our people are good for showing solidarity with other countries in the face of crisis like, like COVID. Now we're talking about we're only as strong as the weakest link and none of us are safe until we're all safe. And there's a danger of thinking about solidarity being that, well, we'll help them because it will help us. But true solidarity is more than that. So I'd be challenging us to think, do we act in solidarity with poorer countries because we want to protect everyone or because we want to protect ourselves? Do we want global vaccination equity for us or for them? Leadership is a lot about political leadership and Ireland is a leader in the world. And I was preparing, reflecting on 2004 the, uh, the smoking ban. And I was at the World Health Assembly with our now Taoiseach, but it was then Minister for Health, Michal Martin, at, to speak about HIV and AIDS. And leaders from around the world were coming up and congratulating him on the smoking ban. So he, that was an example of, of leadership, really effective leadership, and many countries followed. So maybe now we can see something, do something similar and not be doing something with only marginal benefits when it has implications for poorer countries, but beyond all to address the equity issues. And we have a clear framework for that. It's the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Equity is the heart of that. The strap line is leave no one behind. Now, can we think of an example of, of, uh, an example of, more, of, of more so leaving people behind than is happening now with global COVID vaccination? And our own international development policy, A Better World, goes even further, talks about reaching the furthest behind first. So that presents a real challenge to us. And I was very pleased this week to hear the announcement of a 140 million increase in Ireland's overseas aid budget for next year, going over a billion for the first time. So there's an opportunity there to increase our support for, for COVID, the pandemic, and for vaccination. So the various challenges needed to be, to be addressed. There's the supply issues. It's about global production and distribution, country capacity issues, that countries have weak health systems, and demand issues where uptake is low for, for various reasons. I'll make just a few comments in, in relation to these. In terms of supply of vaccines, the world's in a much better place. Global production is improving and will reach 2 billion a month by January 2022. Then it becomes a distribution problem. And that's why measures like the TRIPS waiver and the, the COVID-19 technology access pool are important. Measures that will allow and enable production in low and middle income countries. It is much better for them to be able to produce their own vaccinations and not relying on them being passed on from, from other countries. Ireland contributes to COVAX, the global financing mechanism for, for COVID vaccines. That was nicely put on one occasion as by someone saying that's an input, not an outcome. And as Chris said, it's, 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 it's not delivering. With them. It's f the, the, the contribution is, is supporting it, but while there's global competition for what vaccines are available, the, the lower income countries are being left behind. 
And then we need to address redistribution. And, I've, and there's an estimate I've, I've read of 1.2 billion vaccines, excess vaccines in the higher income countries that won't be used, that will be wasted if they're not shared. Good to see that Ireland is sharing. Recently, Ireland donated 335,000 doses from Ireland to Uganda and is donating more through the COVAX mechanism. So some of these are the, the messages that the Doctors for Global Vaccine Equity have been promoting. And like Chris, I encourage doctors everywhere to, to sign up to these, to be a voice for global vaccine equity. And my last slide is to talk about the support for health systems in low-income countries. And there is much that we can do from Ireland to, in the immediate term, to support countries to control COVID-19, to maintain essential services, to protect health workers. But equally important to think longer term, how to build stronger, resilient health systems. As the Global Fund report said, resilient and sustainable systems for health are the foundation for defeating today's infectious diseases and the basis for preventing, preparing and responding to future pandemics. We need a long-term approach and not just for infectious diseases, but, but for all health issues. And I think this is where the college can play a very meaningful role. And the college here already engages with countries in Africa. One of the most important aspects of any health system is a strong, sustainable, skilled workforce. And our college can support other countries in developing their workforce. And an example of that is the, already is the Equals Initiative, the college working with the College of, of Medicine and Surgery in Zambia to develop medical specialization across all specialties. And there are many members and fellows of the college engaged in different initiatives with low-income countries. They can be developed more to support the COVID response and, and support countries with COVID vaccination. Looking to the future, we're talking about building back better, a much misused term during the pandemic. But for health, I think we're talking about not just going back after COVID to the way things were in lower income countries with the inequities that are there. And it's particularly about the right to health, universal health coverage. That's the key, the key approach, that everyone everywhere has access to the health care they need without experiencing financial hardship. So we can play a role in that. Thank you.